United Church of Christ on this brisk, somewhat chilly, maybe even cold, but beautiful autumn morning. We are delighted that you chose to be with us this morning as we worship and seek inspiration from a God that we believe is still speaking and longs for us to listen and respond. I hope that you feel at home with us this morning, whether Sunday morning worship is part of your regular routine, you're an occasional churchgoer, or this is your first time. We're all on a journey, but at different places on that journey, some confident about where they're going and how they'll get there, others questioning and considering. But all are welcome to join us as we journey together, finding strength and support in community. Later in our service today, the leadership of our Sacred Conversations on Race, or SCORE, committee will invite each of us to identify ways in which we, as a community, can commit to boldly continue to answer God's call to us to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. I hope that all of us will prayerfully consider their invitation with an open heart and mind. I am so glad that you are here today. Welcome. when it seems that the only change we notice 
is the worsening of our situation. We must keep on keeping on. Our ancestors did it, and we are the beneficiaries of their perseverance, just as future generations will benefit from our efforts to create a more just, compassionate, sustainable, and peaceful world. But on a practical level, what exactly are we supposed to do? Particularly if we feel a lack of control, powerless to have any meaningful impact on our present situation, and lacking confidence in our ability to positively shape the future for ourselves, our family, our community, let alone the larger society in which we live. So this week we turn once again to a prophetic message from our past to see what relevant insights or guidance it might provide for us today. The exiles to whom Jeremiah was writing in today's text included the leaders of society, priests, prophets, skilled workers, even a king. People who were used to being in charge and giving orders, positions of power and privilege, now finding themselves at the bottom of the social order. Their world has been turned upside down, and although their situation wasn't as bad as it could have been, so for instance, instead of being sold off into slavery, they were allowed to keep their families, their communities, their public gatherings, and their worship services. But still, they were captives, living in a foreign and hostile land, and they knew it. It had been two years, two very long years, and most likely their nerves were beginning to fray at the edges. Daily frustrations and discouragements in danger of blossoming into communal depression. So Jeremiah gives them some advice on how to cope with their new normal. Advice that is surprisingly simple yet incredibly powerful. And also pretty challenging because it's so counterintuitive. He tells them to keep on living their lives like they normally would. Build houses and live in them. Get married and raise children. Settle down. Go to work and pray for your community. But those routine activities take on extraordinary significance when done after a disaster, in captivity, or whenever you feel powerless because you are reclaiming your power to imagine a future, to hope. This letter is a letter of hope that things will be okay eventually and they should go on with their lives. They are to have families, to seek the well-being of the people where they live, to make plans for a future with hope, for there is hope of return back to their homeland, back to life, as they knew it. Now Jeremiah knows that the hope for return will not come in their lifetime, but they are to live with that hope in their new home, to become people of hope rather than people of hate, or people of violent retribution, or people of fear. God has called them to become people of living hope. Fueled by hope, endurance of an untenable situation becomes possible. We will find it easier to keep our eyes focused on the vision of a just peace for all of creation and to keep journeying towards it. So that part of Jeremiah's message seems to make logical sense to me, and I can attest to the fact that it actually sort of helps. When I'm tempted to slip into a pit of despair, about the unbelievable actions and inaction of our global, national, and local leaders, about senseless violence and persistent systemic injustice, and willfully ignorant decisions that we as a society are making that will inflict damage on our planet for generations to come. When I feel that way and am tempted to crawl up into a ball and pull the covers over my head, I refocus on my family, my kids, this community that I call home, 
and the future that I'm willing to invest in for them, for what I hope for them, and it gives me the energy to fight another day. However, the last part of Jeremiah's message in today's text gives me more pause. That part about seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for its well in its welfare you will find your welfare. <coughs> in other words, pray not just for your enemies, but literally the people who are oppressing you who have taken away your freedom, who are making your life miserable. Because their welfare is tied to yours. Now, from a pragmatic perspective, there's a certain logic in that. Because if you're a captive in a foreign land, and something horrible happens to your captors, like a hurricane or a typhoon or an enemy invasion, you are likely to be hurt too. So praying for the welfare of the community is prudent. And similarly, to choose a more timely and personal example for me, if in fact our country is on the brink of a constitutional crisis, praying for our country, including those causing the crisis, is also prudent since I live in the country. But emotionally, that feels hard. Realizing that despite the bitter rhetoric that every day seems to make the social and political divisions in our country stronger and more permanent, that in God's eyes, my community includes those that share my point of view and those that despise it. Because some days, it feels like they despise me, not just my point of view. This feels like a major test of faith, a really hard and unfair task. But on the other hand, maybe it's the only realistic path to a more just, compassionate, sustainable, and peaceful world. Someone has to break the cycle of mutual destruction, and perhaps God is calling on it to be us. It's pretty easy for me to relate to this passage from the perspective of the captives living in exile in Babylon. Because although I'm not in any sort of physical exile, like many others these days, I feel somewhat displaced. I'm no longer in a place of confidence about the future. I'm uncertain how long this mess, this increasingly discouraging situation in our country, our community, our world is going to last. And I could use a bit of good news. So Jeremiah's letter of hope to the exiles in Babylon, although challenging, does provide some encouragement for me and hopefully to, to many of you as well. But as I close, I'd like to invite us to reflect on it from a different vantage point, that of the Babylonians, the people living in the country where the exiles now reside. Now certainly some of the Babylonians were directly responsible for the capture and stripping of freedoms from the Judean exiles. But it's likely that many more were only tangentially engaged with them. They didn't proactively cause them pain or even wish them ill. They may not have known them personally or even given them much thought about them. They just went on living their daily lives. And yet God reminds us through Jeremiah that they are now all parts of one community and that their fates are intertwined. The exiles are encouraged to go on with their lives and pray for the well-being of their captor, to be the people of living hope, to act their way into a better future. Wouldn't the instructions to the Babylonians be similar? to go on with their lives and to pray for the well-being of the exiled who are now living in that city. To act their way towards a better future, one that includes the Judean exiles. To build community with them and to treat them as neighbors. 
I invite us to reflect for a moment on how we respond to those who experience America as a place of exile. Maybe they didn't choose to be here, but nonetheless, here they have been, perhaps for generations, but it still doesn't feel like home. Maybe they did choose to be here, but it's been made clear to them daily that they don't belong. This isn't their country. They will always be aliens, never equals. Maybe they've always been here, but they don't feel completely safe or welcome because they're different in some way that prevents them from enjoying the privileges and freedoms of the dominant culture. How do we actually treat the exiles in our midst? Consider the ways the Church Universal has upheld and indeed benefited from oppressive systems that create exile for others. And the rationalizations or excuses that we as individuals use to avoid loving our neighbor as ourselves. As a community and a denomination, we devote meaningful energy towards calling out and advocating to correct systemic injustice. And these big efforts are critical, crucial and critical to creating long-lasting change and moving us ever closer to the vision of a just peace. But today's text also reminds us of the value and impact of small, seemingly ordinary acts that show love to our neighbor, no matter who they are, that build relationships and give people something to look forward to, that remind them and us of God's comforting presence and constant love, even when things seem bleak, that spark the hope that will help them and us endure the present while planning for a better future. We are all part of God's beloved community, the captive and the captor, the poor and the rich, the powerless and the powerful, even the Democrat and the Republican. Our fates are inextricably tied together. For the good of creation, God calls us to simply love our neighbors reassuring us that God will be present with us on every step of that challenging journey to the promised vision of a just and peaceful world. So simple and yet so powerful, and not always so easy. May God grant us the courage and strength to be people of living hope. Amen.
And SCORE will review the sticky notes and see if we can identify patterns of topics of a or actions that could form the basis for small groups who could act together. And we'll make a sign-up sheets that relate to those um, actions or topics so that over the next few weeks, we can begin to work collaboratively on shared goals. But you need not join a group. Your individual actions, prayerfully considered, can have an important impact, as Pastor Gloria just mentioned. We invite you to act on your values in whatever way you can, to stand up for and stand with immigrants, those who came to this country as enslaved people and or indigenous people, as they fight to gain their rightful place in this land, as scripture commands. These do not have to be big, fancy, overwhelming actions. They should be manageable acts for which you commit to be held accountable. Whatever your commitment, we urge you to act on it. And we do so for theological reasons. Justice is a biblical imperative. And prayerful action of any size or scope opens windows and doors in God's universe. As said in Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. If you commit boldly and take action, the world will be changed. Our time of reflection will start now, and when you are ready, please bring down your post-it notes, turn on your tea light, and bring it to the front. Thank you.
together this morning. It's in your bulletin if you just sing through it. I'd like for us to sing it through through the melody twice, and then I'll give us instructions as how to divide as a three-part round uh, of this this morning.